to invite you all to this educational webinar on Duane's Retraction Syndrome. Uh, I truly appreciate Orbis Cybersite for giving us this wonderful platform. We have three speakers and three panelists. Uh, Dr. Andrea Molinari from Quito, Ecuador. Dr. Minakshi Swaminathan from Shankar Netralaya, India. And myself, Dr. Suma Ganesh from Dr. Shroff Charity Eye Hospital, India. We all three have been associated with Orbis in so many years and have taught so many pediatric fellows, especially mentoring them and teaching them. It's a wonderful opportunity. I would like to now invite Dr. Minakshi Swaminathan to speak on the pathophysiology, causes and etiology and systemic associations of Duane's Retraction Syndrome. Thank you, Suma. So happy to be part of this initiative. And um, thank you, Orbis, for this wonderful um, opportunity and platform that you've given. So I'm going to be speaking on the etiology, pathophysiology, and systemic associations of Duane Retraction Syndrome. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, um, whichever part of the world you are in. So let me start off by saying that no financial conflict of interest to disclose, and I have the consent of patients to share photos for educational purpose. So let's get to know each other. So. I'd like to know, all of you out there, who you are. So this is an audience poll. Are you an ophthalmologist, a resident that is a postgraduate, a fellow in training? Are you an allied ophthalmic personnel, an optometrist, orthoptist, or an ophthalmic technician, allied person in training, or others, maybe even family and friends? So please go ahead and vote. And I'm going to wait for a few seconds for you all to finish voting. And then let's see who you all are who tuned in to our workshop today. All right, so the polls are here and it says 44% are ophthalmologist, 19% resident, quite a number of allied ophthalmic personnel. That's close to 30%, wonderful. So Duane's retraction syndrome is classified as a CCDD. It is a congenital cranial disinnovation disorder. And we'll soon see how that eventually happened. So it is a constellation of a combination of any of the following signs. Complete or partial absence of abduction, retraction of globe on adduction, narrowing of palpable fissure on adduction, partial deficiency of adduction, oblique movements with attempted adduction, upshoot or downshoot of the globe with attempted adduction and reduced convergence. Does it have other names? Yes. It's also known as the stilling turk Duane syndrome. So that's Jacob Stilling from Germany, who first described uh, a case of DRS in 1887, soon followed Sigmund Turk from Switzerland in 1896, he later published this in 1899, but it was left to Alexander Duane from USA, who in 1905 published a case series of 54 patients describing in detail the uh, clinical characteristics and findings. So now we move on to the epidemiology and demographics. One in 1,000 to one in 10,000 in general population is the prevalence. One to 5% of all strabismus cases are DRS cases. It can be an isolated unilateral finding, which is usual, or can be found in conjunction with other congenital anomalies. Females are more affected than males. Susceptible genes are sex limited. Maybe that's the reason. Also, perhaps there is higher estrogen levels during embryogenesis. The left eye tends to be affected more than the right eye in types one and three. Now we move on to the etiology. So 
first postulated were the mechanical anomalies as causing DRS. So Turk said maybe it was the abnormally tight lateral rectus which behaves like an inelastic band. This is what he found or said or postulated in 1899. Wolf in 1900 subsequently noted that it's a congenital anomaly. And also, could this be related to birth trauma or nuclear aplasia was the questions asked by other scientists later in the 20th century. Dual insertion of the medial rectus, one in the usual place and the other posteriorly, the contraction of which can cause the globe retraction was another theory supporting the mechanical anomalies as the etiology. We do know that some acquired DRS or bands that occur in the orbits can simulate DRS and Dr. Molinari has an excellent paper. But no support was found during surgery for this mechanical anomaly that was postulated. Could it be innervational anomalies? In 1956, Brennan studied the electrical potential generated by muscles in various gases in DRS. No lateral rectus potentials were found in abduction and maximum lateral rectus potentials were found in adduction. He concluded that the lateral rectus is receiving innovation during adduction of the eye. Electromyography studies followed. All the studies so far found that the medial rectus innovation was normal. So Strachan and Brown quantified this paradoxical innovation. They also found that synergistic innovation between the medial rectus and verticals and obliques Metz later in his paper in 1976 presented that there was slowing of abduction and adduction saccades during the saccadic velocities recording that he did in patients of DRS. Next came questions that could this DRS be explained by central nervous system anomalies? Well, the sixth nerve innervation was thought to be defective to the lateral rectus. Okay. But is this nuclear? Is there anomalous innervation by the oculomotor nerve at the nuclear level? Or maybe absent or hypoplastic abducens nucleus? These were all the postulates. Or could the whole thing be infranuclear? Where it's the cavernous sinus, where the third and the sixth nerves are closer anatomically. So maybe there's something going on there. How, what does support the present neurological anomalies theory? There is presence of synkinesis in patients with VRS, Marcus gun jaw winking, crocodile tears. Also, abducting nystagmus in the normal eye also supports the brainstem anomaly. But it was this paper that came out of William Hoyt's lab in California in 1998, which was published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology, which showed by magnetic resonance imaging that there was absence of the abducens nerve in Duane syndrome. This has been subsequently proven by others. And this is a paper that came from RP Center, Dr. Padeep Sharma and group. With all this, it seemed befitting that DRS be classified as a congenital cranial disinnervation disorder, as was put together in the paper in 2011 in I by Asaf. What about a little bit about genetics? Well, 90% are sporadic, 10% are familial, and the inheritance appears to be autosomal dominant if the DRS is part of a syndrome. Twin studies have also been done, and they show a unique phenomenon in which one eye is affected on the right eye of the twin, and the, second, the other twin has the left eye, and this is called mirroring. Uh, there's no time to go into the details, but that's fascinating. What about genes? Yes, the autosomal dominant variant has been localized to mutations in the CHN1 gene. The isolated variety into the DORSI, DURS1 gene on 2Q31, and the Duane radial ray syndrome into the SAL4 gene on chromosome 20. Well, but a lot of information came through work from Dr. Elizabeth Engel's lab. And uh, this is a fascinating paper that was published in IOVS 
which looked at the expansion of the CHN1 strabismus phenotype. So hyperactivating CHN1 mutations have been described in individuals with Duane retraction syndrome with or without vertical case abnormalities. This study looked at five family members with distinctive ocular dysmotility patterns that co-segregated with the novel hyperactivating CHN1 mutation. And what did they find? Aha, they found all five clinically affected family members exhibited monocular or binocular supraduction deficits, three in the absence of GRS. MRI in four affected individuals demonstrated small or absent abducens nerve in all four small oculomotor nerves in one and small optic nerves in three. And the very interesting finding was that superior oblique muscle volume was also decreased in three of the individuals supporting trochlear nerve hypoplasia. Before we go to systemic anomalies, since there is a large number of trainees, I want to suggest this paper that came out of LV Prasad um, by my uh, good friend, Dr. Ramesh Kekunea. It was published in Clinical Ophthalmology in 2017, and it's an excellent review, and I direct you to read more from this paper. Okay, we go to the next audience poll. Are you ready? Which of the following can be seen in DRS? Number one, absence or hypoplasia of abducens nucleus, anomalous innovation by the oculomotor nerve, hypoplasia of the trochlear nerve, or all of the above. So we'll wait for your response. Fantastic. A large percentage of you have said that it's all of the above. Fantastic. Okay, we move on to systemic associations. The Duane Radial Ray Syndrome, or the Oki Hero Syndrome. This has an important association with DRS and mutations in the SAL4 gene. Patients exhibit a shortened radius, abnormal angulation of the wrist and or thumb as very well seen in this radiograph. What about other syndromes? Aha, the Golden Heart Syndrome. I'm sure you, many of you or most of you are familiar with it. It's presence of ptosis, preauricular skin tags, epibulbar dermoid, deafness, coloboma, and pinna defects. DRS has also been associated with the clipal fail anomaly. And this is an excellent photograph that demonstrates a short neck, usually fusion of at least two vertebrae of the neck, also found a Marcus Linger winking, microcornea, optic nerve hypoplasia, cleft palate, facial asymmetry. The Holt Oram syndrome shows skeletal abnormalities of the hands and upper limbs, Orner syndrome, keratoconus, morning glory disc, and cardiac anomalies. Well, this is the Wildervang syndrome, which also has the clipal fail anomaly, deafness, nystagmus, myelinated nerve fiber, and limb deformities. And the arthrogryposis multiplex congenitor also can have DRS associated as multiple vertebral anomalies, cataracts, staphyloma, spina bifida, microphthalmus. It's an excellent paper published uh, titled The 1960s Epidemic of Arthrogryposis Multiplex Congenitor. Oculocutaneous albinism, a very important association. And of course, the fetal alcohol syndrome. This is a landmark paper on thalidomide embryopathy, which was published, I believe, as an AOS thesis in 1991, titled Thalidomide Embryopathy, a Model for the Study of Congenital Incompetent Horizontal Strabismus by Dr. Marilyn Miller, a good friend and a mentor. So why is it really important to know these systemic associations? Because it's a reminder when we see a patient of DRS to check the other systems. It also paves way for future genetic studies. And children who need surgery for DRS may be difficult patients from the anesthesia perspective because of their neck deformities. With that, I conclude my talk. Thank you for your attention. And now we, I'm gonna move, we're gonna move on to the next segment. And I take great pleasure in introducing my good friend, Dr. Suma Ganesh. Dr. Suma Ganesh is the 
Director Head of Pediatric Ophthalmology at the Shroff Charity Eye Hospital in New Delhi. She is a popular teacher, an avid researcher, an excellent clinician and surgeon, and a very dear friend. Over to you, Dr. Suma. Thank you, Dr. Minakshi, uh, for the kind words. I would uh, start my present. That was an excellent presentation, and uh, I think I would continue on it. Um, I would be speaking on the classification and the various presentations of Duan's retraction syndrome. Um, has she already said, uh, introduced the topic as it is a spectrum of neurological, mechanical, innovational, and genetic abnormalities? Various systems of classification were proposed to understand the mechanism and the presentation of DRS. We all know that Huber's classification is the most popular, but it does not cover all types of cases. Aluvalia et al. modified the classification based on the alignment in the primary gaze. And a recent paper published by the Korean Journal of Ophthal uh, came up with a new classification just this month, in fact, uh, type and angle of strabismus uh, classification of duans. So I would go to the Huber classification, the type one. Uh, we can see where there is a limitation of abduction. Most present common presentation is an esotropia, a normal or a defective adduction. And we find that there is narrowing of the palpable aperture and retraction of the globe on adduction. There's also widening of the palpable fissure on attempted abduction. So always the face turn is towards the involved side. I like this, um, uh, this diagram by Rosenbaum, who says that, uh, how do you grade your uh, limitation, abduction limitation, to minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one? Because this is important, when, especially when we are thinking of surgical strategies. It is not very seen uh, just um, a one presentation. You may have varying types, like a type one, with a large esotropia and a large face turn. And you could have an abduction deficit much better than minus four, but with minimal globe retraction. You can have one with no upshoots, downshoots, and just a small esotropia, small face turn, minimal globe retraction. Or here you can have a type one with esotropia, but with a severe enophthalmos. So we need to see all these before planning your surgical strategy. The type two is mainly exotropia presentation. There's a limitation or absence of adduction. There's narrowing of the fissure on attempted adduction. There is normal or reduced abduction. And there's a face turn, which we see normally to the same normal side. So we also get varying presentations like a large exoduans with an upshoot, a large face turn. So you can see the incompetency here, and there's an upshoot here. We can also get a large XLD exodiaris. Here, this is around 70 prism diopters with a small right hypertropia. We can get with a small exotropia, but with a marked globe retraction. She just had small prisms of around 12 prism diopters of exotropia. So there are varying presentations. And the type 3, which is much more common than the type 2, around 15%, has limited abduction and adduction. There is retraction of the globe and narrowing of the fissure and adduction. But in these, we find that it could be orthotropia or exotropia or esotropia. And we find that there is frequently upshoot and downshoot with attempt reduction in these cases. So here, this is like an orthotropia. Here, you have an esotropia with upshoot and downshoot with a minimal face turn, but severe globe retraction. Here is an exotropia, all type 3, with an upshoot and downshoot with a large face turn but, and globe retraction. So we see there are varying types, and it is important for us to find out what exactly is the patient coming for and what exactly we have to correct during surgery. This is a type four, which we call as a synergistic divergence or the divergence splits, where you see there's a large exotropia, there is an adduction deficit, and simultaneously abduction on attempted adduction. So this is the EMG when you do, it, it demonstrates co-contraction and excessive LR firing on adduction. So you also have a type five, where there is a vertical retraction syndrome, where you have a horizontal DRS plus a globe retraction on vertical positions of gaze. So you can see that there could be a limitation or no limitation of vertical eye movements. Here you can see that there is a limitation on depression. So bilateral 
uh, ESO-DORS is also common. It's not as common, it's around 10%. And uh, we find that it could be with fusion with a small ESO or with a, just ortho and with a small face turn, or it could have without fusion, like you have in this case, a large esotropias and a narrow fissure you can see in each eye during adduction. You can also have a bilateral exoduance with a bilateral upshoot and a face turn. This is a type three with a bilateral exoduance and here you note there is a V pattern. So the patterns which are there, it could be an A pattern also, which is whenever you see an A pattern, bilateral cause. And Kushna also said there is a Y pattern which is seen. He said, he published that there is a Y pattern also seen in cases of duance. So males, it is much more common around 29%, but it's also in this case, we've seen it in a female with bilateral exoduance. Now the polling question is, what is the most common type of refractor error which is seen in DRS? Myopia, myopic astigmatism, hyperopia or hyperopic astigmatism. Please do submit. Okay. The answers, the answer is, hypermetropia is the most common uh, refractive error which is seen. And the most common amblyopia is an isometropic and ametropic amblyopia. So we need to check for the accommodative component too. It should be corrected. Like you can have an isotropia, then please we can we should do the cycloplegic refraction. And maybe the duans does not require surgery. It, the uh, isotropia could just be corrected with the glasses. So it's important to correct these to restore binocularity. So a nice paper again published by Dr. Ramesh Kekonia and group on the grading of Go Globe refraction. I love this paper because it helps us to uh, find out like before and after, what are your surgical results, how much you have managed to correct the globe retraction. So no narrowing is zero, one less than 25%, two 25 to 50%, a grade three is 50 to 75%, and a grade four is 75%. So how do you measure this? So with the involved ion adduction, you take a scale and you take a scale and you measure the palpable fissure at the center. And then you compare it with the normal eye in the fully abducted position. And thus you can grade your globe retraction, whether it's grade one or grade two or grade three and grade four. And then you can see after surgery, how much uh, the, grade, the refraction has improved. Or even in cases where you plan to do any transposition surgeries, you could do it in grade one or two, but we would not prefer it in very severe globe refractions like in grade three or grade four. The same paper also uh, published about how to grade the upshoots. So same way with the involved eye in adduction, you draw a line which is drawn to the, from the pupillary center to the normal eye. And then you find that you could grade zero or grade one where it lies between the pupillary center and here you have between the pupillary margin and the limbus, grade two, grade three, and grade four, where the cornea disappears below the lid or the pumpkin sign. So we do see anomalous vertical movements also in DRS, like an innovational and mechanical. We know what is mechanical is an abrupt up and down movement. And we have innovational upshoots like a gradual elevation and depression. The characteristic is they may have a vertical deviation in the primary position. So Mohan et al. found that mechanical is said to be more common than innovational, and upshoots and downshoots are more common in unilateral DRS type 1 and type 3. We also find that they are associated with vertical deviations. So we need to see what about the vertical deviations we need to measure in the side gazes and also in the tilts. So this is a case where we had a left hypertropia, which increased along with the duance, which increased in left gaze and also in left tilt. So um, um, we have seen mostly an ipsilateral spirituous contracture in cases with a congenital superior oblique palsy, but we've seen this also in a case of duans. Maybe this was because of long-standing upshoots. So the polling question is, what is the most common pattern seen in DRS? A Y pattern, an X pattern, a V pattern, or an A pattern? Very good. The answer is the V pattern. So how would you differentiate now? It does not come into the clinic like a duans and you know it's a duans case. Uh, we have to differentiate it from a six nerve palsy, from an infantile esotropia, because many times we get in the clinic that uh, is it an infantile esotropia? So we need to do a doll's eye maneuver for this. 
uh, to rule out there is no, uh, if you do a doll's eye head maneuver like this, you know that there is no abduction deficit. We know that in duans, the esotropia, the deviation is much less than the limitation of abduction. Whereas in a sixth nerve palsy, the limitation of abduction is equal to the amount of deviation. And in a Mobius syndrome, we'll get it along with it, the seventh nerve, and we also will see the uh, hyper hypertrophy or the aplasia of the tongue. We can see this. So that's how you will differentiate it from all uh, from each other. So to summarize, uh, I, uh, there we need to look for an abduction deficit, an adduction deficit, the amount of retraction, upshoot, downshoot, the abnormal head position, the primary position deviation, whether it is unilateral or bilateral and the fusion. And depending on these, the surgical strategies have to be planned. And for this, we have none other than Dr. Andrea Molinari, who has been my mentor too. And uh, she will be speaking on the surgical strategies of Duan's retraction syndrome. So I think all are waiting for the surgical uh, strategies. I see many questions coming up on the surgical strategies. And uh, we have none other than Dr. Andrea Molinari to address this. Thank you, Dr. Suma, for the invitation, your kind words. Also, very good friends of mine, Dr. Suma and Dr. Minakshi. Thank you also to the CyberSight team for putting this educational event together. And thank you to the audience for taking the time from your COVID quarantine to spend it with us. And I'm going to address the topic on how to surgically manage patients with Duane syndrome. But I want to start by saying that in most patients with Duane's, surgical treatment is not indicated. Be aware that surgical treatment can produce disappointing results. Therefore, it is advisable not to operate on orthophoric patients with no anomalous head posture or disfiguring globe retraction like this case here. The patient must be informed that there is no surgical procedure that will restore the normal ocular motility. Surgery does not eliminate the fundamental abnormality of innervation. Indications for surgery in patients with Duane syndrome are very specific and generally circumscribed to patients with marked anomalous head posture, noticeable ocular deviation in primary position, disfiguring retraction of the globe on attempted adduction, and cosmetically unacceptable vertical deviation of the eye in adduction. So having said that, I'm going to focus now on describing the surgical procedures that can be used in these patients and suggest an algorithm of treatment for them. As in many strabismus cases, and this is especially true in Duane cases, different strategies can be adopted in order to reach the same goal, which in these cases are improving an anomalous head posture, correct any angle of strabismus, ameliorate globe retraction, and expand binocular field of single vision. Mirror rectus recession of the affected eye is one of the most popular procedures performed in patients with isotropic Duane. It will improve or eliminate a face turn and correct an isotropia of up to 20 prism diopters. Recessions of the medial rectus of the affected eye shouldn't be larger than five millimeters since it may result in significant limitation of adduction. Producing a diplopia in the field of case where the patient was diplopia free before the surgery. It is better to leave the patient with a small residual anomalous head position and not sacrifice the entire adduction capacity of the affected eye. There are three situations where you want to consider adding a contralateral medial rectus recession. In cases of large angle isotropia in primary position of more than 20 prism diopters, cases with isotropia and significant globe retraction where a lateral rectus recession has to be added to the medial rectus recession in order to correct the globe retraction and to prevent the recurrence 
of contracture in the medial rectus of the affected eye by creating a fixation duress on the non-affected eye and driving the affected eye outward through Herring's law. If an asymmetric recession is considered, the recession on the contralateral sound eye should always be larger. Unilateral single lateral rectus recession improves or eliminates a face turn, corrects an exotropia up to 20 prism diopters in primary position, and will help alleviate the severe globe retraction. If the exotropia is over 25 prism diopters, adding a recession of the contralateral rectus might be considered. As in medial recti, if an asymmetric bilateral recession is chosen, the recession of the contralateral lateral rectus should be larger. Contrary to the medial rectus recessions, the lateral rectus recessions can be larger, up to seven to 10 millimeters. It is very difficult to have an overcorrection in these cases. Transpositions of the vertical muscles uh, in, in Duane cases have been advocated by different authors for a number of years. The goal of the surgery is to generate active abduction vector forces in order to enlarge the area of single binocular vision. This will bring several advantages over simple recession procedures, like improving the abduction capacity, and this will enlarge a single binocular vision field. And transpositions seem to induce less recurrences as recessions. But induced vertical or torsional deviations have been reported in up to 30% of the patients. There is also a higher risk of anterior segment ischemia and worsening of co-contraction with anomalous vertical movements, which will result in increased globe retraction, which is one of the most common complaints of these patients when it is present. And here you can see an example of a published paper where you can recognize a narrower palpebral fissure in the post-op pictures, even though her abduction improved. But in my experience, the globe retraction bothers the patients more than the limitation of abduction. Therefore, transpositions should be avoided in patients with significant globe retraction. There are different variants in the transposition procedures. You can transpose both vertical muscles or just one. The muscles can be totally or partially transposed, or they can even be transposed without disinserting them, like in the Nishida procedure. When only one muscle is transposed, it is usually the superior rectus. But in cases with V pattern, or more limitation of abduction in depression, some authors prefer transposing the inferior rectus. One muscle transposition does not create as much globe retraction as bilateral rectus mus muscle transposition. And this is why uh, lately most authors prefer the one muscle transposition. Also, that these transpositions can be augmented with a resection of the transposed muscle or with a faster suture. Resecting the lateral rectus of the affected eye of Twain patients has been contraindicated for a long time. And this was so because of the concern that the globe retraction might worsen as a result. However, this procedure has been performed successfully in selected patients, and it has the advantage that does not increase globe retraction, as you can see here, and does improve abduction as good as in vertical rectus transposition procedure. This procedure works best in patients with more than 25 diopters of prism diopters in, of isotropia in primary position, with mild globe retraction with no adduction deficit, with very limited abduction capacity, and an absence of anomalous vertical movements. Resections of lateral rectus should never be more than 3.5 millimeters, and the recessions of the medial, not never more than five millimeters in order to avoid overcorrections. 
Combining the medial and lateral rectus recession of the affected eye has proved to be a very useful procedure to diminish the globe retraction. The amount of recession required needs to be large, and in order to maintain balance in primary position, the lateral rectus is recessed more than the medial rectus. Fun procedures are used in two specific situations. On the lateral rectus of the affected eye, in order to avoid the side slipping of the muscle in cases of significant up or down shoot of mechanical origin, of course, and on the contralateral medial rectus of a Duane eye with significant limitation of abduction, as you can see here, in order to limit the excursion of the operative eye, this one here, when looking towards the affected eye, too much deduction deficits. Why splitting is very useful in treating mechanical up on down shoot, and this, this was one of the questions that was written to us. The, the lateral rectus is split horizontally in half from his insertion as far back as possible, spreading the muscle halves 20 millimeters apart, as you can see in this picture. Each half of the muscle should be recessed a couple of millimeters or even more if an exotropia in primary position is present. Recession of the superior rectus muscle is required in cases where a secondary contracture of the muscle results from severe and persistent upshoot of innervational origin. In such cases, a hypertropia exists in all superior field of gaze, as you can see here. Superior rectus recessions in these cases must be large. This also ameliorates <clears throat> the globe retraction, which is present in some cases, as you can see in this case. So if you have a patient that is orthophoric, no anomalous head posture, no significant globe retraction or anomalous vertical movements, as you can see in the case in the upper part, the wiser approach would, would be not to operate. But if significant globe retraction is present, as you can see here, you can consider recessing both horizontal recti in the same eye and Y splitting or a fan in the lateral rectus to correct a noticeable up or down shoot. In patients with isotropia, if the isotropia is small, like in this case, consider recessing the medial rectus of the affected eye or an asymmetric bilateral medial rectus recession if the angle in primary position is 25 present diopters or more. You can combine these procedures with a lateral rectus recession or a wide splitting or fan of this lateral rectus if you want to improve globe retraction or up and down shoots. In cases of large angle without much globe retraction or much up or down shoot, you can consider transposition of the vertical recti or a recess resect procedure. Here you can see both procedures done in similar patients and recognize that they are equally effective. For example, in this case, uh, a superior rectus transposition with foster suture was done. And you can see how the abduction improves without affecting the globe refraction in adduction. And the same result is obtained with a recess resect. You can see here improvement of abduction and not much globe retraction in the post-operative pictures. In patients with exotropia, consider recessing the lateral rectus of the affected eye and also adding a wide splitting if up or down shoot is present. Like for example, in this case, you can see here, well here it's, it's only, only our, our right lateral rectus recession was done because there was not much globe retraction. If the angle of exotropia is large, you can consider recessing the lateral rectus of the non-affected eye. However, recession of the contralateral rectus muscle should be avoided in cases with large globe retraction that may signify significant anomalous innervation of the affected lateral rectus, like for example in this case here. So, 
um, in these cases, uh, recessing the lateral rectus of the unaffected eye will elicit more innervation to the recessed lateral rectus in order to maintain fixation. This, as you can see here, it will be an anomalous uh, branch of the third nerve going to the lateral rectus. So this augmented innervation will also affect the media rectus through Herring's law. If the lateral rectus of the affected eye is receiving a significant amount of abnormal innervation from the third nerve, it will also contract and thereby worsening the exotropia. This, this is why in cases like this with a uh, huge global retraction, you should not recess the contralateral lateral rectus. So to conclude, there are no rigid rules regarding surgical treatment. Each case should receive individualized consideration according to the clinical manifestations observed. And remember always that surgery does not eliminate the fundamental abnormality of innervation. So without further delay, delay I will start my case. This is a two-year-old boy that presents to my office with this significant chin-up chin posture and also a face turn to the left. He had a right variable, a right eye variable ptosis. You can see here while, while um, sucking on his lollipop, you can see how the lid goes up and down. He had a very significant limitation of elevation of the right eye. The eye did not reach midline and also a uh, very important limitation of left abduction. This was very, a very interesting case because it was a case that had several uh, congenital cranial disinnervation disorders in one in the same patient. So he had on, in his right eye a monocular elevation deficit, Tosis and Marcus Gunn, and on his left eye he had the Duane retraction syndrome. So what did we do with this patient? Since this eye was hypotropic and isotropic, we decided to transpose the medial rectus to the superior rectus with a foster suture. And on his Duane eye, we transposed the superior rectus to the lateral rectus also with a foster suture. And since the medial rectus was contracted, as it is in most Duane cases, we also performed a recession of the medial rectus of four millimeters. The Post-operative result was pretty good. Uh, we could correct the anomalous head posture completely. The patient was orthophoric in primary position. And as you can see here, there was a significant improvement of the elevation of the right eye and a modest improvement of the abduction. The, the patient and their parents were very happy you can see here the anomalous head posture disappeared completely. And the boy learned to open his lid by moving his mouth. So this is a clear example that in cases like this, transpositions procedures are really powerful and useful. Thank you all for your attention. And, then, and now we are going to listen to, let me stop sharing my screen, and we're going to listen to Suma's, Dr. Suma's cases. There are a few questions for you, Dr. Andrea. Uh, yes. Uh, the question is, uh, between Farden and Y-Split, which is the best for upshoots? Um, In my experience, I have not done yeah, I prefer Y-Splitting. I prefer Y-Splitting because, as you know, Faden is always very messy if you need to reoperate those patients. The next question is, uh, if there's a large exotropia, won't it be better to do a, a lateral rectus perioxidal fixation? Yes, yes. It's, if it, there is a large, uh, a large exotropia, especially and, and uh, if there is also um, a significant uh, anomalous innervation. In these cases, periosteal fixations can be very useful and in my experience does not produce overcorrections. There's a question from Shailaja which says if there is significant upshoot and V pattern on clinical evaluation, 
but there is no tightness of lateral rectus on FDT. Is inferior oblique recession a better procedure or, or Y split? Uh, this is to Andrea. If there is, well, that depends because then we come, we, we have to discern if, if, that, if it is an innervational upshoot or if it is a mechanical upshoot. I would say, and, and the only way, as Dr. Suma explained, is to see how the eyes drift upwards, if it's, if it's abrupt or if it's slowly. If it's abrupt, I would prefer to do the Y splitting. If it's slowly, then I would prefer to do the inferior oblique weakening procedure. I would like to add, like in an innervational upshoot, there will also be associated hypertropia uh, in the primary position. So that could add and you could uh, see whether if the hypertropia, it is uh, increasing in any gaze. And um, that we could plan an inferior oblique recession. There is a paper by Awadin et al. that says that you could do an inferior, my, inferior oblique myectomy in such cases. And also if there's associated torsion, if in the fundus you have a torsion, uh, then maybe you could uh, plan the inferior oblique recession. But otherwise, uh, if it's mechanical uh, and when it is abrupt, I think it is better to do a Y-split procedure. And there's a question for you, Dr. Suma, from Eftemios Chalkias, which says, can you please explain the differential diagnosis again? Oh, I think I went too fast. Uh, I was, I, the differential diagnosis is basically, uh, the first is a sixth nerve palsy. Like say, whenever you have a Duans presenting and there's an esotropia and there's a limitation of abduction, the first thing which comes to your mind, maybe it is a sixth nerve palsy. So a sixth nerve palsy will have a very large deviation and the, the limitation of abduction will be the, similar to that of the deviation. Whereas in the duance, it will be iso duance. It is not, uh, it is a smaller deviation and you get a much more larger limitation of abduction. And still suppose in, it's a smaller child and you are not sure whether because, uh, whether it is an infantile isotropia, because an infantile isotropia also will have, will present with a limitation of abduction. You need to do a doll's eye maneuver in all these children because a doll's eye maneuver will tell you whether it is uh, infantile isotropia with a large deviation and with a minimal amount of uh, limitation of abduction? Or is it uh, duance with a smaller deviation? Or whether it is, uh, is six nerve palsy? We know six nerve palsy is um, less common, but then we need to rule out six nerve palsy because it is a neurological cause and there may be a neurological cause and we, need, we then need to do imaging. The other thing is uh, Mobius syndrome, I said, where uh, there could be an associated seventh nerve and the uh, hypertrophic trunk, uh, tongue, sorry. So uh, this is how we, you will differentiate between the four cases of uh, child presenting with the same esotropia. I will go to now the two interesting cases. So we have time. And uh, uh, Suma, there are specific questions for Dr. Andrea. If, uh, okay, fine, you, fine. You can take just a couple of them. One is from Alejandro Armesto. It says, uh, and he says, uh, Andrea, did you perform the Nishida procedure for these patients? Yes, I just answered. I just typed that question. I just typed the answer. But let me t uh, t tell this to you. No, personally, I have not. I have not. But there is a very nice paper. I don't remember the author now who presented uh, this technique in, and with very, very nice results. And, and, the other, and there, is a, there was another question. Uh, ex uh, asking me how to perform the FADN. Well, okay. the, for the FADN, uh, you have to expose the muscle very well and uh, dissect it from the check ligaments because you have to go very far back. In the lateral rectus, the FADN is a little bit more complicated than on the medial rectus because there is uh, where you have to place the FADN is usually place the inferior oblique. So at one pole, there is not much problem, but on the other pole, it is. But I guess if you place it on the superior pole uh, or, or the superior border of the muscle uh, alone, th this will be enough. Uh, also, um, the Mariam Gabriel asks about the role of Botox. No, I have no experience with no, Botox no experience. and Duane syndrome at all. I don't know if you have. No, or, I don't no. Uh, or experience. And um, uh, another attendee asked uh, Suma, what about saccadic velocity in DRS and sixth nerve? 
will, will it be reduced in both? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, and uh, uh, that is how you, in fact, uh, differentiate from a restrictive and a paralytic strabismus. Uh, saccadic velocity will be normal in a restricted strabismus and it will be reduced in, in a paralytic squint. So that's how it will be important, yes, to do the saccadic velocity also. I think we'll go on to your cases, Suma, and then we'll come back to some more questions. Okay, fine. So uh, this is a young male, a uh, 24-year-old male who presented to the clinic. Um, he had, uh, his complaint was he's not able to move the right eye temporarily and nasally since birth a small right eye, he had a significant face turn, but the rest of the history was all uh, not significant. So we can see here the severe globe retraction and there was a limitation of adduction and abduction. His best corrected visual acuity was normal and uh, the rest of anterior segment and posterior segment was normal. So he had uh, on examination, sorry, uh, he had a right, uh, he had exotropia with a right hypertropia uh, around 20 prisms, and it was equal. Uh, there was a uh, limitation of abduction and adduction. There was globe, severe globe retraction, because we can grade it now, and also a severe upshoot, a grade four upshoot with the pumpkin seed sign. And for near, there was a deviation of 30 prisms. An MRI was done. There was a question whether we need to do in all cases. Like in this case, I uh, specifically asked for an MRI because we know that there are some uh, literature search which says that there's some that there may be additional abnormalities in duans uh, because of the paradoxical innovation between the horizontal muscles and the vertical rectile muscles. There could be hyperplasia of the vertical rectile muscles. So, in this case, because there was a hypertropia, I just wanted to check out if there was not a hyperplasia of the inferior rectus muscle. Here we can see that the right the absent, right uh, ab, uh, abdominal nerve nucleus is absent. So in patients where uh, you have a doubt, you could go in for uh, MRI imaging. So here you can see the globe retraction, uh, which is seen um, on adduction and on depression. So it was around 72% grade three globe retraction. And here, uh, so all, also there is associated drooping of the upper lid and the uh, elevation of the lower lid. This has been um, published by Dr. Eisenberg in, uh, in a few, in his uh, published in American Journal of Ophthal, long back, seen, seen in 52% of cases. So, um, so the question is, uh, there is now a vertical deviation, which is equal to the horizontal deviation. There is a face turn to the left. There is severe globe retraction. There's an also an upshoot, which is uh, around four plus. And uh, there's, I think from the uh, videos, you could make out that there is a mechanical and an innovational upshoot. It's a combined upshoot. And uh, there was also limitation in abduction and adduction. So now has uh, many are asking whether we should do a lateral rectus periosteal fixation or we should do a large lateral rectus recession for the large exotropia, which is seen. Or, uh, but there's also associated upshoot. So should we do a Y split? And what about the hypertropia? So uh, I would last to ask, uh, what would be Dr. Andrea's plan? Uh, like this, the FDT shows there is a type medial rectus, lateral rectus and superior rectus. Um, so what would be the plan? And, um, and I would share with you what I went forward and did. Well, uh, in, in these cases, you always have to address the main concern of the patient with, in this case, is the retraction, the globe retraction, and the hypertropia. Uh, the exotropia is also present, but it's not as important as the other two features. So the other thing you have to also acknowledge is that the, the upshot here is, has a double etiology. One is a mechanical etiology, and the other one is the innervational etiology. So the, the mechanical etiology can be easily addressed with a wide splitting of the muscle, of the lateral rectus muscle, and also the hypertropia with a recession of the superior rectus, which has to be large. Uh, there was one question about doing periosteal fixation. Yes, you could do that too, but 
actually my position is always go from for from less invasive procedures to more invasive procedures and so i would start with a wide splitting and lateral rectus recession you can always if this doesn't work you can always go back and take the lateral rectus and fixate it to the periosteum if it didn't work as expected so in my in my opinion this case what i would do is what you did which is a lateral uh, superior rectus recession and a lateral rectus recession with Y splitting. So yes, I went ahead with the large recession of the lateral rectus uh, because it was tight. I did a Y split and a superior rectus recession also. We could do a lateral rectal, uh, lateral rectus periosteal fixation, but then how do we manage the uh, vertical, um, the hypertropia? Uh, like uh, oh, we could there the are. With a superior rectus recession. Yes, um, uh, you could do a superior rectus recession and a transposition. Does it? Uh, uh, a transposition? You mean transposing? Like a partial uh, VRT? Case, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no. I, th I, th I, my, my pr uh, preference in this case would be what what you did. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Minakshi, any comments? Um. You got and you got a, a fantastic result, as I can see. Yes, you are, you have a great uh, result, and uh, I, I agree with um, uh, Andrea. I'm also comfortable, and your plan. I'm comfortable doing a, a lateral rectus Y split as the first procedure, and if, since the FTT was uh, positive, was uh, you have to do uh, recess the superior rectus as well. And uh, when we go on to more and more muscles, um, you know, it, it's going to then, uh, you know, risk for anterior segment ischemia as well. And more the number of um, recti that are, are undergo large recessions, the P of starts becoming uh, wider and bigger. And so you have a new cosmetic problem as well to uh, remember. So I would have done exactly what you have done. And I think um, the um, patient's improvement in head posture and the considerable improvement to the upshoot are a proof that your plan worked well. And let there me add one thing, Dr. Suma, regarding mm -hmm. what you asked about a transposition. Remember, I, I would not recommend transposition procedures in cases with significant globe retraction. And this patient had a significant globe retraction. Yes. The globe, uh, it was still not perfect. So should I was thinking of whether I should add one more medial rectus recession. It was tight. Uh, but there's already a minus two uh, adduction limitation. So should I go well, ahead I, and do... Mm. As I said, Dr. Suma, remember, this case is, will never be perfect. Never. So uh, you have to compromise and, and actually try to solve what bothers most to the patient. I agree with Andrea, and I would uh, always uh, very clearly state what are the indications for surgery in every single case? And as Dr. Andrea very nicely said, there is no one answer for each case has to be looked at individually. And so in this particular patient, your clear indication was the abnormal head posture, which was driven by the uh, cosmetically unacceptable upshoot and cosmetically bothersome vertical. And I think if you have uh, addressed and solved most of these, I think uh, you've done good. If it was very large, because there was one question which asked that whether, how would you titrate uh, when, if you had to do also a medial rectus recession uh, in a large, uh, in upshoots or downshoots of uh, exotropias where you would do a lateral rectus large recession. And if you also wanted to add on a medial rectus recession, how would you, but there is no surgical table as such, because there's, um, so how much would you do um, uh, the medial rectus recession? This was, was asked one of the questions well, like. Uh, I have, I have, I, I'm doing this for now 35 years and I have really many disappointing results at the, at the beginning where when I did large medial rectus recession. Right now, I'm very conservative with medial, medial rectus recessions of the affected Duane's eye. Maybe I will be more permissive or more, um, it's more forgiving the, the recession of the medial rectus of the sound eye, but of the affected eye, I try not to do large recessions. Right now, my the, 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 the most uh, larger number I perform for medial rectal succession is five, no more, no more than that.
I used to do more before, but not now. Yeah, I have cases who have later on uh, gone into a consecutive exotropia and then you have limitation adduction and abduction and like a divergent splits. It, uh, then it becomes like a synergistic, uh, synergistic divergence and then you do not know how to treat. Uh, you so, know, if the, if the patient gets diplopia in a field of case where he, bef bef before the surgery, he did not, he gets disappointed and, and, and he complains about that. Uh, I wanted to add that these patients already are known to have poor convergence, uh, defective convergence. And then uh, when you go on uh, adding medial rectus recessions, larger and larger, uh, you're going to make the convergence even worse. And that is something to consider uh, in these patients. So uh, I looked up literature. There was very few literature, uh, like um, I just found uh, three to four publications on the vertical deviations with duans. It is more commonly they uh, with A pattern associated where they have done a superior rectus recession. And uh, also they have Dr. Mohan, Kamar Mohan has done a superior rectus and an inferior rectus recession for the upshoot and downshoot for the vertical deviations. So uh, not much of uh, publications on this, but the superior rectus recession has really worked. So I, uh, it has worked in this case. And... Um, but case two, uh, we go to the next case. Uh, so this is a simple case, uh, but uh, this is mainly uh, being uh, put up so that we know which cases to do a superior rectus transposition, which cases not to do a superior rectus transposition. Because that is the, uh, I think that's a question nowadays everybody asks and even the parents are asking. So this is a child with a 25 prism isotropia with minimal globe retraction. We can see that it's around grade one and uh, there is a, there is an abduction deficit of minus four. And uh, so in this case, um, felt that superior rectus transposition will work. So any other views like, uh, because now uh, it is established, I've checked there's so much of review of literature on superior rectus recession, uh, transpositions, and all are uh, recommending that we could do uh, superior rectus transposition for an abduction uh, improvement. They have not found any vertical torsion diplopia or any vertical uh, squints postoperatively. Uh, in cases, uh, in some cases, they have even done uh, inferior rectus transposition where there is a V pattern, or in A pattern, they have done a superior rectus transposition along with the uh, horizontal. And uh, so it is now being recommended in few cases. So what is your opinion? Uh, I have done a few cases. Any takes on this, uh, both of you? Mm -hmm. um, well, if you want me to answer first, uh, I think th these type of ca cases are particularly um, uh, good for doing the superior rectus transposition, but not only that technique, uh, you can also do a recess resect procedure like, like I explained. And if you ask me, I have done both procedures, but right now I favor the recess resect. And actually it shouldn't be, it, it can, should, it must not be a resection, it can be also a plication. And the good thing is about plication is that you disturb less the uh, anterior segment circulation. So if you ask me with this case, a superior rectus transposition would work very well, but I prefer to do a medial rectus recession um, uh, up to five millimeters and a plication up to 3.5 millimeters. No, not more than 3.5 3 millimeters. And with that, you always can do, if you do application, you can always go back and do a transposition procedure afterwards if you're not satisfied with the result. But that, as I showed with these two cases that were very similar and also similar to this case, both give you exactly the same result or very similar result. Uh, would you agree? Because uh, Dr. Minakshi, I personally have not done a resection uh, for an iso uh, I, so, I have only, uh, I have probably only done a couple of patients where I've done a small amounts of uh, resection or plication. Uh, I have done more superrectus transpositions. Uh, I've also burnt my fingers with that procedure. It is a really quite a powerful procedure, especially if you combine it with a medial rectus recession. If you do not have access to um, adjustable suture in children, you have to be really, really cautious because I have had a patient uh, where uh, 
they developed an exotropia right away, uh, even with a very modest medial rectus recession and uh, a super rectus transposition with uh, a foster suture. And so it is ideal if you can titrate the amount of medial rectus recession. More important is to really quantify the amount of esotropia preoperatively. Because if the esotropia is of a smaller degree, I would yeah. be much more inclined to do Andrea's plan than risk doing an SRT and uh, uh, creating uh, exotropia, diplopia, and the patient is miserable. But, but Dr. Minakshi, remember that um, also my suggestion of recess resect is with patients of at least, with at least 25 diopters of isotropia in primary position. If it's yes. less, I don't do a recess resect. So this patient had a 25 prisms esotropia in primary position. Uh, yes. So, but a small amount of recession with an SRT did work well for her. Um, she had no vertical, uh, no, no vertical diplopia, torsional diplopia, and even on she had no torsion. Uh, like checked on the fundus and we uh, dilated her and checked the fundus and we found that there was no torsion. She was not even complaining of. So, I would uh, go ahead with the superectus transposition in such cases. Uh, if we have time for the last case. Um, this is a six-year-old girl with an abnormal head posture and a squinting of eyes since the age of one year. Uh, she had uh, visual acuity was normal, uh, with best corrective visual acuity was normal. Fundus showed uh, torsion, an exhaustion in the left eye. And she presented with uh, exotropia, with hypertropia in the primary position. And, and uh, I don't have the video for this, but there was a gradual elevation of the left eye and uh, there is a small amount of globe retraction though it is very small so be, if you have to grade it maybe that's why it will help it was around a globe retraction of one and uh, she had also a face turn uh, so with a v pattern also so um what would be the plan of uh, because the questions which in my mind is exactly what challenge had asked the question is should i go ahead with an inferior oblique or uh, recession or a myectomy or should I do a Y split in this case? Is this a mechanical upshoot or an innovational upshoot? Here we can see that there is a um, there is an uh, ex incompetent exotropia which is seen, and uh, even the past three step test, if you see here, is not very significant. Um, it was a string, just a small left hypertropia increasing on left tilt. Um, so what would be the plan? And um, uh, the fundus showed torsion. So, um, would you go ahead with an inferior oblique recession? Dr. Minachi, you, you go first now. Oh, I, oh, I was just going to say, I think it's very important to be able to see the video mm -hmm. and to be able to distinguish really what are, we are dealing with. Are we dealing with a mechanical or an innovational you know, upshoot that I think that that's as Andrea, as uh, you yourself have very nicely uh, illustrated in your talk. I think a, a video is invaluable uh, to be able to uh, distinct, make the distinction and that would help guide our surgical plan. But it is clear that the patient does have a large V pattern which needs to be addressed. So if you decide that this is not really a case for inferior oblique weakening, then I would go for uh, a bilateral lateral rectus recession with a shift to take care of the pattern, which probably would be my plan. How about you, Andrea? Well, actually, even only with the pictures, I doubt that this is, um, that this is a mechanical upshoot because there is, oh, there is no retraction. I don't see no retraction at all in this picture here. So um, I think this is an inferior oblique overaction. And I would, and, and there is a significant V pattern. There is also an underaction of the superior oblique in this picture. So I would go, yeah, I would correct the, the, the exotropia with lateral rectus recession. Although she has only 18 prism diopters, maybe I would go only for a one a lateral rectus recession and inferior oblique weakening, uh, a small inferior oblique weakening in this eye. And that's all what I would do. So um, that is what exactly um, has been done. So I did a large lateral rectus recession. 
and in small weakening of the inferior oblique and uh, this is the result but uh, in this case she does have uh, isotropia uh, at, um, and now the residual with, uh, with diplopia in this gaze now uh, post operatively although uh, she is ortho in the primary gaze so maybe i should have done a little bit uh, lesser amount of uh, lateral rectus recession uh, or maybe uh, that's what i feel because now she does have diplopia in this gaze and uh, though in uh, preoperatively it was um, a large uh, angle so these are the I, cases i think uh, this is for the questions remaining um, which we have there are many questions we, yeah we can we what can we can do is keep answering the questions uh, by typing them uh, if if it's if it's possible if the cyber yes. side team is okay with this so we so, can answer all the questions. Dr. Molinari, um, we prefer if you answer them live on the session. If you don't have time, time now, we can have you answer them by email and post them later. Okay. So if you want uh, to answer a have, couple more live. Yeah, uh, we, can, we can answer a couple of more questions. Okay. In here it says, in innervational upshoots, how to know if it is inferior oblique overaction or due to abnormal su superior rectus innervation? That's a good question. Well, one thing could be look at the fundus and see if there is ex excyclotorsion. If there is excyclotorsion, there is no doubt there is inferior oblique overaction. And also, if there is abnormal superior rectus innervation, you usually uh, will have a hypertropia that is also present when the patient uh, is looking towards the affected eye. So, I mean, in AB duction. But in, when you have an inferior oblique overaction, you will have the hypertropia will be larger in adduction. When you have an abnormal superior rectus innervation, you will have the hypertropia also in AB duction. So, in all superior fields of gaze. Dr. Suma, why don't you answer another question? So we do one, one, one. Uh, the question, question, when do is, I do, uh, excuse me, mm. there is the, when I do R&R surgery in Duane syndrome, uh, I already- I personally do not do an R&R surgery in uh, Duane syndrome. Um, unless uh, if there is, a, um, like in cases uh, where there's a divergent splits or a, a divergence in kinesis, where there's a large amount of exotropia, there is underacting, uh, I get there is an underacting medial rectus. There I would do a lateral rectus periosteal fixation. And along with it, I would add a medial rectus resection. So I have, so in exotropia, I have still done in few cases a medial rectus resection, uh, where I find that there is an underacting medial rectus uh, uh, action, but I have not done in a case of um, esotropia or lateral rectus resection. Dr. Suma, hmm. uh, there's a question from Kher Chowdhury, and I think they've confused you with me, but he asked in Dr. Meenakshi's third case, is there any use of adjustable suture in the lateral rectus recession? Um, because you, your concern was that you had induced a little bit of uh, consecutive esotropia in the left case. So is there any use for adjustable sutures? The question. Yes, we could do a uh, adjustable or uh, lateral rectus recession on an adjustable. Uh, it, if because especially in this case where uh, you find uh, that uh, there is there was a lot of uh, incompetence. Like in one case it was forty five prisms and another case it was just two prisms. So you could go ahead and do an adjustable. I am not a very ad uh, big adjustable fan uh, myself, and especially in small children. Uh, because uh, I uh, and I have initially done it in my initial years, but now I have uh, I leave it to only cases uh, where I find that there is a lot of incompetency or uh, there is diplopia and uh, and not sure or there is a variable deviation. In those cases, I go ahead with an adjustable. Otherwise, uh, I yes, I would agree with you that adjustable would have been a better option. There also have been more than one question on, uh, would you titrate your recession dosage based on finding a tight muscle? Like uh, Sophia and Saidi asked, in case like this with tight LR, is it better to do lesser amount of recession? Or would you titrate it based on the tightness? 
um, I think that the recessions should be calculated uh, with several factors. As we said before, each case is the case. So each case has a specific, uh, has, has to receive a specific plan for their clinical characteristics. And I usually uh, calculate the amount of recession I'm going to do with several factors, not just the, the measurement in primary position, but also how tight the muscle is and, and how, how much uh, innervation anomaly the patient has. So this is something, there are no tables. In, in Duane's, there are no tables that you can follow as in other types of, of strabismus. And there's also been a lot of questions on the timing of surgery. I mean, how early would you operate? That is, even if you were able to examine the patient, how early would you operate or would you wait for a little while? Uh, I, I will give, you, give my answer after I hear from both of you. Dr. Suma? Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, well, if you want, I can answer. I can answer first. So, so I, I think I, I usually, I usually, sorry, I, I usually don't operate very early. I would say uh, in one in a one year old or even maybe in a two year old because since you have you want to see all the characteristics the patient has in order to plan for the best surgical approach. So and you know. A one-year-old or even two-year-olds are really difficult to examine. You want to know how much abduction deficits there is, how much adduction deficit there is. Uh, you want to measure the patient if possible. So I wait till the patient is cooperative enough, and I don't say an age because some children are very cooperative with two or three years, and some others are, they are not cooperative since they are seven years old. So when I can have the the amount of information I want, that's the moment I do the surgery. Yes, I would agree because most of them they have a face turn and uh, they maintain their binocular vision. So basically, when we want to operate them early, like the main concern is. Whether, um, whether they will have a good uh, binocular vision potential. I think they have a good sensory. Uh, so as long as, as she said, that uh, you would wait to get a good assessment. Uh, and uh, once you have a good assessment, like I, 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 uh, I remember like in a two-year-old or a one-year-old, I have written it as a six nerve palsy. And uh, if the patients have waited and later on, I found that there is severe globe refraction seen later on in the child. So I would wait uh, before uh, I go ahead, maybe. I think the youngest I've done is a four-year-old or a three or a four-year-old because um, uh, the child also had an associated hypertropia. Uh, so there was a vertical deviation along with it. So that is why I have operated. I think it was around three or four years of age of the child. So that's the reason why I've gone early and operated. I would like to uh, add to what uh, both of you have already said, and I, I completely agree with you. I definitely want to rule out the presence of amblyopia uh, and treat the amblyopia uh, because they can have just the anomaly itself can drive the abnormal head posture. And sometimes uh, you can't presume that there will be binocularity. Uh, so it's good to know. It's good to be able to test that. It's good to be able to get reliable vision. And like Andrea rightly said, you want to really be able to assist the patient in, the, in, its, in her in entirety. You want to get all the characteristics clearly uh, made out and visible so that you can titrate the plan for that particular individual. It would be nice before the patient uh, turns uh, you know, seven or eight, before they become more conscious about their appearance, uh, before they have to turn their face so much in their activities and uh, interaction with their peers and in school, it would be nice to be able to intervene before that, but not at the cost of a good examination. There is a very uh, interesting question here. Um, uh, it's a patient that, previ that was previously diagnosed with a six palsy, palsy in a secondary to an infectious process, resolves in one month, and one and a half year later presents with esotropia, limited abduction, uh, narrowing of the lid upper uh, palpebral fissure, and they are, are asking if this 
could be a Duane with later onset. Actually, I have never seen Duanes are congenital yeah. congenital problems, yes. and but oh. what I have seen are uh, cases that mimic Duane syndrome that have some, for example, like uh, cicatricial or restrictive uh, issues secondary to contractures that can mimic Duane cases, but they are not Duanes. No, no, what's your experience? Yeah, you can have an acquired ones. Um, so you can have acquired ones like uh, your know, like it uh, presents like um, like in cases, but that will mainly present like an inverse ones you can have. So, um, but it's uh, not a real yeah. Duane. Yeah. It looks like a Duane, but it's not mm -hmm, a real. There's mm -hmm, no yes, yeah. the innervation anomaly that mm -hmm, is characteristic yeah, of Duane. Yes. I think it's a, it, it could it's possible that you get something like a pseudo duanes maybe the orbital infection caused uh, yes, so. yes. fracture of the medial rectus and then that eventually caused uh, globe retraction and uh, limitation of abduction and narrowing and could present like a, a pseudo duanes uh, is the only way to explain this. So there is another question here. When you say a large recession of the superior rectus, how much do you mean around how many millimeters? Well, uh, the vertical, the, the, super, the superior rectus recession has to be large. I would say at least seven to 10 millimeters and you can do even more. Yeah, I, I, have know, question, seven point, you have, I have done seven points. I have done around a seven millimeter recession, seven to seven. Yeah for the 20 prisms of hypertrophia. Uh, it, has, it had worked, so though the muscle was very tight, yeah. so that is why I plan to do just a seven millimeter of recession. For uh, example, the case I showed, I did like, it was more, it was like eight or, or 10 millimeters and he still had residual uh, hypertrophia in primary position. Uh, how do you treat a vertical DRS? So we have completed this, um, the vertical DRS. And uh, in a type four, what is your uh, management? Uh, like uh, most of us uh, go ahead with the lateral rectus periosteal fixation and along with it add a medial rectus resection. For the divergent splits, there's a question like what is the method of treatment? How would you manage a type four DRS, the divergent splits or the divergence in kinesis? A divergent split like the one you uh, yes, demonstrated yes, yeah. in, during your talk, yeah. I would do a periosteal mm -hmm. fixation in this case. Yes. Have you done a lateral rectus splitting to the medial rectus in such cases? Um, like uh, has a, he has a scene in third nerve palsies? Are you asking Dr. Mina? Yeah, uh, no, yeah I'm, uh, I'm asking you, Dr. No, I'm not. Uh, Andrea. If I have done um, a Y splitting in, in a no, case you like split the, the lateral rectus and the splits uh -huh. are brought towards the medial rectus, like in the case of a, like in the case of third nerve palsy, where you have limited adduction, and then you take the split halves of the lateral rectus and uh, trans, uh, bring it to the medial rectus. No, so, I have not um, done that because I prefer to do other type of procedures. I think we have answered most of the questions. Um, yes. Yes, we have answered most of the questions. Um, I think uh, it was a very wonderful session and I enjoyed doing this webinar and I would like to thank uh, the audience for bringing such a great uh, audience. And also, uh, I hope uh, each of you have learned much more. And if any questions, you could directly email Dr. Andrea or me or Dr. Minakri. And I'm sure Orbis CyberSide can help us uh, help you all with uh, sending us the questions. And I think uh, we could end the session here. And I thank you all for uh, being here. And I thank Orbis CyberSide uh, for uh, once again. I know there's been a lot of effort behind this, uh, arranging all this. Uh, Jonathan, Lawrence, thank you so much for helping us out. Of course, thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a great thank day you. too. Bye bye. Bye, bye. bye bye. Thanks everybody and thanks Lawrence. Bye. Bye.